the Right Honourable R. G. Menzies. Fellow Australians, it is my melancholy duty to inform you officially that in consequence of the persistence by Germany in her invasion of Poland, Great Britain has declared war upon her and that, as a result, Australia is also at war. Before I end, may I say this to you? In the bitter months that are to come, calmness, resoluteness, confidence and hard work will be required as never before. I know that, in spite of the emotions we are all feeling, you will show that Australia is ready to see it through. May God in his mercy and compassion grant that the world may soon be delivered from this agony. Hitler can't possibly imagine that he's going to be France and Britain. He doesn't. He just wants to grab Poland and the Danzig Corridor and hope we'll let him keep them. We can't. No, we can't. Which means that a world war is inevitable. Millions of British and French lives will be lost. And so the seeds of another war, our grandchildren will have to fight. Where's the sense in it all? There'd never be another war. What the hell does Hitler think he's doing? He knows Britain's guaranteed Poland. He wants war. I'm supposed to be here to make the world a better place to live in, not tear it apart every generation. The Labour Party supports the government in its declaration of a state of war with Germany. But we do not believe that Australian troops should be sent to Europe Australian resources must be kept in Australia. Our immense area and tremendous coastline forces us to think of our own safety. No one can guarantee the future course of the war. Right Honourable the Prime Minister. In reply to the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, the force we are raising is for the defence of our country. Do we have to guarantee that they won't be sent abroad? In some circumstances, they may be used abroad. It would be irresponsible of me to commit our troops to any overseas venture until Japan's intentions are made clear. We've got an election coming up next year. The Labour Party are going to shriek that we've left the country defenceless. If your brother's being beaten by a bully, you don't check to see whether you're going to be safe before you go to his aid. Before I commit our troops, I want London to assure us that if the Japanese pose any threat, they'll send a fleet to Singapore. Well, if that's what you want, I'll go to London and get it for you. I have recommended that the troops be sent, but Menzies is still hesitating. Look behind it, Richard. Menzies doesn't strike me as the type to hold back when the Empire's at risk. Uh, there's an election coming up. Our Labour Party will oppose the move totally. Especially now there's a stalemate in Europe. They keep stressing the threat from Japan. Japan? Can't even make a watch that works, let alone wage a war. The New Zealanders are sending their troops and they're just as threatened by these mythic Japanese warriors as Australia. The New Zealanders won't commit themselves until we do. Have committed themselves. We've got their cable this morning. They're supposed to consult us. They obviously felt they wanted to make a gesture of loyalty. We need your troops by the spring, Richard. Hitler won't sit still forever. I've already ordered certain ships to sail in anticipation that they will be available. Now, do you want me to cancel that order? It's really on now, isn't it? You sound as if you're pleased. There was supposed to be a war on over there, but nothing was happening. John. Hundreds of thousands of people, possibly millions, are going to be killed before this is over. It won't be the privileged. It'll be the working man and his family. There's only 20, Jack, and they're his age. All they want is excitement and action. There's a list of dead on a monument in every main street in this country. And 20 years later, it's about to happen all over again. It's important he realises it isn't a game. Of course he realises it. Now, come on, don't be such an old sourpuss. I was just glad, because I want to see Hitler get what's coming to him. 
We all want that. The problem is, he seems to be winning. In my view, the French collapse may come at any moment. The British Empire is faced with three possibilities. That we can carry on with the prospect of victory. That we can carry on for a period. Or three, that we cannot carry on. If we cannot, the Empire must try to attain terms that retain for us our liberty and independence. So I'll do that. If we cannot, we must fight on to annihilation. Better dead than under German rule. Germany's spectacular and overwhelming military success has caused consternation around the world. Make that most immediate for the Prime Minister personal, himself only. Cable to Casey in Washington. I appreciate your Prime Minister's concern, Mr. Casey, but I am totally aware of all the facts. I'm doing all I can. Britain is getting all the arms and equipment we can send her to the point where our own military buildup is being seriously jeopardized. With due respect, Mr. President, that might not be enough. Britain is in grave danger of a total collapse. I understand your anguish, your concern, Mr. Casey, does you credit. Britain is for you the mother country. But the situation that I'm faced with is this. However much sympathy my countrymen feel for Britain, it is not enough for them to take the drastic step of going to war. You just watch and let Britain die. If it was up to me alone, Mr. Casey, I think you know what I'd do. And unfortunately, I'm ahead of most of my countrymen in this. <laughs> most of my Congress, too. We're just gonna have to wait until they catch up. The German war machine strikes ruthlessly into the heart of France. The French fight bravely. But the British Tommy must live to fight another day. As always in times of crisis, the best of the British character comes to the fore. Brother comes to aid brother, braving the worst that the Luftwaffe can throw at him. Here on the beaches of Dunkirk, a miracle occurs. A mighty armada sweeps across the English Channel to lift its comrades from the jaws of their merciless adversaries. Dunkirk is not a defeat. It will stand for all time as a symbol of what a determined and resolute people can achieve in the face of brutal tyranny. I have thought carefully in these last days whether it was part of my duty to consider entering into negotiations with that man. But if we try to make peace now, we would get no better terms than if we fought it out. It will become a slave state run by a puppet British government under the fascists. There will be attempts to invade us, but we will repulse them. Our navy is extremely strong, and our air defenses will be much more easily conducted from this island than from across the channel. I am convinced that every man of you would rise up and tear me down from my place were I for one moment to contemplate surrender. If this long island story of ours is to end at last, let it end only when each one of us lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. ask my question again. There are two French colonies just to the north of us. With France falling, what's to stop the Japs from taking them? Would it be in their interest? If it was, what's to stop them? I don't think it's a great worry. It's a great worry to me. What's to stop the Japs from taking those islands? And if it comes to the crunch, what's to stop them from taking us? The United States fleet. And what if the Americans don't want to fight? These are all very hypothetical questions. General, I want the plain truth. Good 
We resist a Japanese invasion. Come on, that's a bit far-fetched, isn't it, Billy? What's far-fetched about it? We've sent our best troops to the Middle East, so how are we supposed to defend ourselves? Well? Our strategy has never envisaged a situation of invasion arising. General, I don't like to tell you your job, but hadn't you better start envisaging it? Your government's assumption has always been that we'd be protected by a British fleet at Singapore. Well, they're in no bloody position to send us a fleet now, are they? How prepared are we, General? As prepared as can be expected. Prime Minister, if the Japanese were to sail down here with one aircraft carrier and one army division, they could take over this country in three days. Anthony. When will the next Australian division be ready to embark? On the 7th. Very shortly, Winston. My chiefs of staff want me to send them to Singapore. But you don't. They'd be more used to us in action in the Middle East. The Australians might feel a lot safer if we sent them to Singapore. If the Australians were ever really threatened, we'd help them, Anthony. It goes without saying. I view that promise with some caution, Prime Minister. Menzies has given us the seventh. Ah, well, what about Singapore? We'll send two Indian brigades. They're more suited to the tropical climate. Uh-uh. Here we go again. Come on. Oh, I'm not shifting this time, Anthony. I can't stand that hole they've dug down there. You'd better come with them. Downing Street sure to be a prime target. Which is exactly why they'll miss. The Seventh should have gone to Singapore. I thought you told us you were going to stand up to Churchill. You were the very one urging me to send our troops to help England a few months ago. As long as Singapore was secure. A remarkable about face, if you don't mind me saying so. Well, Singapore's secure, isn't it? I get a bloody different answer from everyone I talk to. We have been assured that Singapore is strong enough to hold out against anyone for at least six months. England is facing a possible invasion now. All right, all right, you've done it. And you were probably right, so let's stop bickering. For God's sake, if Britain falls, the Empire falls. All the Dominion Prime Ministers should be over there right now. I reckon you should go, Bob. You want to flit off to London now, with an election coming up. I don't think the election results in any doubt. Curtin's looking better than anyone anticipated, Robert. There are rumours circulating that Labour is to join in a national government with Menzies. These rumours I categorically deny. <laughs> we will face the electors in September and we will win government in our own right. <laughs> it has also been suggested that in supporting Menzies' national security bill, I am guilty of turning Australian workers into industrial conscripts. This again, I categorically deny. <laughs> it is a workers' country, and the Labour Party has given its utmost support to the defence of that country and the prosecution of the war. However much we may be opposed to the Menzies government, we are not opposed to the country which that government governs. In this time of peril, the resources of the nation must be placed at the service of the nation. And anyone who disagrees with this proposition must be willing to accept that it may not remain our country much longer. Right now, I think you should go back to Fremantle, do some work in your own electorate. I hear your opponent's working like a dog. Fremantle doesn't vote for me, I'll give the game away. Good day, how are you?
The Menzies government has won the election, but Prime Minister Menzies concedes he has had a close call and says that despite the fact that Labour refuses to join him in a coalition government, he will form an advisory council in which he will seek the views of senior Labour ministers on matters related to Australia's war effort. It's been an election of mixed fortunes for Labour leader John Curtin. In a surprise result, his own seat of Fremantle hangs in the balance and it will be several more days before the postal vote determines whether he has retained it. His work in New South Wales, however, where he is credited with uniting the bitterly opposed Labour factions, produced a big swing to Labour. You thought your effort over there wasn't wasted? I should have listened to Chifley and put in some work in my own bloody electorate. You won't lose, you'll get the vote from the overseas servicemen. They've got me pegged as a pacifist. Even if you do lose Fremantle, someone step down and give you their seat. I'm not chasing my destiny, Nip. If my own electorate hasn't got confidence in me, I'm out of politics for good. I'll go on with you. Jack. Congratulations. I wouldn't admit this to anyone, but I was hoping you would win. It was the worst week of my life. <laughs> and we don't intend this advisory war council to be a mere formality. We are the government and will govern. But we will listen carefully to whatever you have to say. There's one matter on the agenda which is so politically sensitive that I must stress that you are here today under conditions of strict confidentiality. Our service chiefs have just returned from Singapore. What they saw there was scarcely encouraging. Contrary to what London has been telling us, Singapore's capacity to withstand a concerted attack from the land practically nil. Mr. Shedden, will you summarize the main points? The position seems quite serious. To defend the base without a fleet, land forces approximately double those available, together with 582 first-line aircraft are needed. How many planes are there now? 48. Singapore is supposed to be impregnable. Why haven't we known this before? Up to this point, unfortunately, we've always tended to believe what we've been told. That's wonderful. We've sent all our best troops to the Middle East. Without Singapore, we're virtually defenseless. Churchill has to be told. Cable in, straight away. I've already done that. But if it's anything like the other cables I've sent, its effect will be negligible. Prime Minister, I really think the time has come when someone of strength has to face Churchill personally. It's the only way we're going to get our message across. If I go, it has to be on the understanding that I'm given official status on the British War Cabinet while I'm there. Anything less than that and Winston will ignore me. Once again, the world rings with the fame of the Australians for their outstanding contribution to the capture of Bardia. Swooping at dawn with the efficiency that only hard training and confidence in their own ability can bring, they wreaked havoc on an enemy who soon wished they'd never left their sunny Italian shores. Yes, chaps, the war's over for you, and some of you don't look all that unhappy. 70,000 prisoners trudge across the desert into captivity. Not a bad morning's work by the lads from down under, and the timing couldn't have been better. Prime Minister Menzies on his way to London is right there on hand to offer the lads his personal congratulations. makes me proud when I see men like these. The newspapers back home are euphoric. They're saying the Anzac spirit has been reborn. Just read the British press when you get to London. You won't find anything in there about us. They're just treating us like reinforcements for the British Army. Robert! Together in the fray, eh? Shall we go?
Gentlemen, the Prime Minister of Australia. Greece is our only non-Commonwealth ally. And if we abandon her now, we will earn Hitler's contempt and the derision of the rest of the world. Prime Minister, could you expand on the risks involved in this Greek campaign? Most of the proposed fighting force would be Australian or New Zealanders. Well, quite frankly, Mr. Menzies, the risk is fairly high. Uh, three of our divisions will be facing a much larger German force without... With the incalculable advantage of terrain, the area is extremely rugged and the enemy will have to fight through narrow passes. Remember, Leonidas and a small band of Spartans kept the entire Persian army at bay at Thermopylae. The Persians didn't have the advantage of the German Luftwaffe. Before I can recommend this operation to my colleagues in Canberra, I feel duty-bound to seek your assurance that the whole venture isn't a forlorn hope. Well, you have to judge that for yourself. In my opinion, it's a risk we have to take. If you have doubts, you should voice them. This whole Greek adventure has all the earmarks of a bloody disaster, Norman. Three or four of our divisions, with little or no air cover, against as many German divisions as the roads will carry. Cable Menzies. Menzies wants my advice. He can ask for it. Chatting about his talks with Winston, Mr. Menzies described him as a voluble talker and a late sitter. But there are times, late at night, he said, when I've been able to grab 60% of the conversation. Our boys are dying in the Balkans, and the man who recommended the operation to us spends all his time name-dropping in London. The press over there is certainly singing his praises. You must admit, Doc, the British seem to be genuinely impressed. Of course they are. He keeps telling them they're wonderful. We need a leader who can win over the press here. We've got someone who's won over the press. I wouldn't say that, Earl. Ah, you've done a magnificent job since he left Artie. Don't be so bloody modest. The people have had a gutful of Menzies and his intellectual superiority. What they want is a man who can talk to them in their own terms, like you. In fairness to Robert, I think we should keep our criticisms to ourselves until he's home and he can defend himself. But when in Christ are we going to see the man? He's put off his return twice already. Full of courageous men armed with rifles and machine guns can hold Tobruk against any odds. Tobruk must be held. With what? They'll have no heavy artillery, no mortars, no armor, no air cover. They'll hold it until the guns come up. It has to be held. You can browbeat your chiefs of staff, you can browbeat your cabinet, but by God, I will not sit any longer and listen to what must be done when you don't give our troops the air cover and equipment to do it. You plucked our men out of the Middle East into the disaster in Greece, for which the Australian press has crucified me, and now the Middle East is about to fall. At every step and every turn, you've underestimated Germany's power and might. The whole British Empire is at the point of disintegration against a brilliant and ruthless foe, and all you can do is tell us we must, we must, we must. What would you have me do? Surrender? No. Just listen to voices other than your own. It's not that I want to go. With Britain in the position she's in at the moment, it seems almost treasonable to be leaving. It's my leaving. I have to deal with a Brutus or two back home. Ah, oh, they'd be very foolish to get rid of you. They got no one else of your stature. They prefer rural simplicity in Australia, I'm afraid. Hail fellow, well met. 
must be some way to convince them that you should be here. For my own sanity, I damn well hope there is. This is where the real work has to be done. So you can see the coastline. We'll be landing in Sydney in about 15 minutes. Thank you. We're about to move into the most critical period in Australia's history, John. And I feel strongly that I'd be more effective protecting our safety in London than here. Churchill is totally unable to see the war through Australian eyes. And you want us to guarantee we won't vote against you while you're away? With our one-seat majority, yes. The Labour Party has rejected my offer of a national government. I've decided the only course open to me is to offer my resignation. Bob, that's ridiculous. In my recent offer to the opposition, I indicated that to secure an all-party administration, I was prepared to vacate the Prime Ministership. The offer was rejected. I have therefore invited the two parties, my own and the country party, to select another leader. They have unanimously chosen Mr. Fadden. Robert. General Blaney. Hello, huh? oh, Norman. Sit down. Menzies has resigned. Fadden is the new Prime Minister. Fadden? Tell a bit of a yap, but that's about all. Why do they get rid of Menzies? Quite no, sir. I'm asking for details. But it shouldn't let him off. Churchill will make mince out of Fadden. He doesn't learn to stand up to him straight away. It's impossible for the English mind to comprehend that we might have our own point of view. Once any Australian unit gets into the command of an Englishman, it's like prizing open the jaws of an alligator to get it back again. Doesn't mince his words, does he? Blame his anger is, to some extent, understandable. The British still seem to assume that we're merely an appendage. Churchill certainly does. What are we going to do about Tobruk? Blame is saying our boys have got to be pulled out of there because they're dying of malnutrition. And Churchill's refusing to shift them and saying they're as fit as trout. Well, whatever we do, let's think about it carefully. I'm not saying we should let ourselves be pushed around, but we shouldn't assume that we're always in the right. If Blamey wants his boys out, his troops out, I reckon we've got to back him. Don't want another disaster like Greece. Actually, if we give way on this point, then for the rest of the war, I'll have to wait until Blamey decides whether we can use his troops or not before I plan any major operations. We've got to get rid of him. Bad, hmm? Blamey, Blamey! Ah, well, that could be difficult. We can scarcely order the Australian government to, uh, Replace it. I suppose it isn't the time to be splitting the empire. There's one vote between us and government. Give up on him, Doc. Carl's another switch size. Yes, he will. He told me the other day he didn't think Fadden could lead a team of homing pigeons. And if Jack Curtin had get up in the house and behave like the bloody leader he's supposed to be, he's prepared to come over. Jack's as sick as I've ever seen him. It's not the drink. Do you know what neuritis means, Chief? It's a polite medical term for nerves. Now, the truth about Jack that none of you will face is that he goes to pieces under pressure. 
He doesn't want to be Prime Minister because he's scared he can't handle it. You're talking rubbish, Bert. He's scared he can't handle it. This is the first time Jack's been out of action for years. He deserves some loyalty. Our first loyalty is to our country, not Jack Curtin. Now, we've got to get rid of Fadden and his clowns. And if Jack's not up to it, we've got to replace him. Just give the man a fair go, that's all I'm asking. War time is a lousy time to be a Labour Prime Minister, Ben. Everything becomes subordinate to the running of a war. All your hopes of a better society go by the wayside. If we don't win this one, all our dreams of a light on the hill won't even get a chance. You've got to lead the attack on Fadden's budget. Coles needs to see that you can run the show before he'll change sides. Mr. Chairman, we are engaged in a bitter and decisive struggle in which the forces of totalitarian darkness are threatening the very existence and future of the few remaining democracies in the world. Let no one claim that I have lost sight of the crucial importance of this struggle. Nevertheless, the urgency of the situation must never serve as an excuse to impose a totally unfair financial burden on soldiers, their families, low-income earners, and pensioners. Yeah. His mother was supposed to be on his deathbed. We cannot ask the Australian people to give of their all when they see the rich obtaining a disproportionate share of the nation's remaining goods and services. Still flogging the same old dead horse. When in doubt, blame the rich. The Labour Party calls upon the government to adhere to the principle of equality of sacrifice. We are all in this together. I move that the first item be reduced by one pound. Honourable Member for Henty. Mr. Chairman, I have decided to vote against the government. I have lost confidence in the ability of this government to wage the maximum war effort of which this country is capable. Curtin. That's three Prime Ministers in as many months. What do we know about the man? No, we're gathering background on him now. He must know something. Well, he was jailed in the last war for opposing conscription. His father was Irish and apparently has or had an alcohol problem. And as if that wasn't enough, he's a socialist. How can a man with credentials like that be expected to run a country? Oh, Fred. Hello, Elsie. Is it urgent? This is the first afternoon he's had off all week. He insisted I come, I'm afraid. He's been working 15 to 18 hours a day. That can't be good for anyone's health. I'm sure it isn't. Consolation is he's getting things done. No consolation to me. For all I see him, I may as well be back in Perth with my friends. He's out in the garden. Thanks. I haven't made much of a dent in that paperwork you gave me, Fred. There's plenty of time. Huh? I wish there was. I'm afraid military matters are still a bit of a mystery to me. But I think I'm learning a thing or two. I read that paper you did on Imperial Defence. Oh, that's an old one. I doubt if it's still relevant. If you didn't think it was relevant, you wouldn't have put it on top of the pile. Now, would you? You realized as far back as 1929 that we might need American help? I reasoned that if Britain was at war in Europe, she'd have difficulty protecting us against Japan or anyone. Yes. 
it still seemed pretty certain that Britain would do everything she could to help us. More certain than I am now. What's made you change your mind? My trip to London. I've come to the reluctant conclusion that as far as Churchill is concerned, the Empire ends at India. Mm. Churchill's insisting we leave our two remaining brigades in Tobruk. And General Blamey wants them out. What's the truth of the situation, Fred? Oh, they're possibly not as sick as Blamey claims, but there's no doubt they're in poor health. Mm -hmm. I think what's really going on is that Blamey wants to establish that he's got the right to control his own troops. <laughs> then we'd better back him. The Empire doesn't mean a damn to these Labourites. This one, a bit of guts and fortitude would hold this situation. They'd run like rats. It's going to be damn difficult getting him out of there. Doesn't Curtin realize that history will brand his countrymen as cowards? Being a pacifist, he probably doesn't care. Well, apparently, the Australians feel they've suffered the lion's share of the casualties in the Middle East. They've sustained no more than we have in the Middle East. And they're carrying nothing like the burden we are everywhere else. The British submarine service alone has lost a third of its men, killed outright. And our pilots have been shot down in such frightening numbers that I've sat at that desk and wept openly as I read the casualty lists. Well, a point could be made, I suppose, that quite a few of the pilots are Australian. Aren't we entitled to count on Australia to make every sacrifice necessary when the Empire is at the point of disintegration? After all that Australian whining about Greece, the truth is that when they got there, they turned tail and ran at the first sight of a German tank. If they'd got on with the job at Gallipoli in the last war, we'd have swept the Dardanelles. You can't breed a decent race out of convicts and Irishmen. Most secret to Mr. John Curtin, the Prime Minister. The withdrawal of your troops is being carried out in accordance with your decision which I greatly regret. Most secret to Mr. Winston Churchill. I very greatly regret that you have had distress of mind over the withdrawal of our troops from Tobruk. Sometimes it is inevitable that the Australian government will formulate a policy at variance with yours. The situation to our north is looking increasingly ominous. If Japan makes any further move south, Will your government declare war? That's a very difficult question to answer. Oh, I'm sure it is. But we'd like to know. What if they attack the Dutch East Indies? <clears throat> Mr. Churchill feels it would be unwise to give guarantees. Uh, we must take a broad view of the war as a whole. We know what that means. Europe comes first. This end of the world can go hang. Listen, brother, our troops are fighting your battles in the Middle East, and we want something in return. Singapore is our only protection. And Singapore's a shambles. Oh, I wouldn't say a shambles. I would. There are certain deficiencies. The Japanese have more planes, but they are technically inferior. What about arms and ammunition? There is a shortage of rifles. What level of shortage? About 15,000. Sir Robert, that's exactly the shortage we had six months ago. Yes, I've made every representation to London uh, short of resigning. So nothing's being done at all? Oh, I wouldn't say nothing. Burma is being strengthened, Malaya. And if Singapore is seriously threatened, Winston has assured me that he will abandon the Mediterranean and come to its aid. Rubbish! Rubbish! Do you think your people back home will ever let that happen? Come on now, be honest. Singapore is very close to the hearts of the British people. And Winston's. So he kept telling me. After what I've seen today, I doubt whether Winston's heart 
is a reliable enough instrument upon which to stake our national future. But Prime Minister, Singapore is not strong enough. Your own service chiefs know it, and we know it. It desperately needs planes, anti-aircraft guns, tanks, rifles, ammunition. After the lessons of Greece... Bruce, we have a desperate fight in Russia. And in the Middle East, we have at last the scent of victory in the wind. Would you seriously have me take away the planes from battles that are to battles that possibly may be? Europe and the Middle East are vital, but Singapore... Singapore is an invulnerable bastion, Bruce. It is a heavily garrisoned island fortress that cannot possibly fall. Yes. Yes, of course. Thanks. Washington has cabled that the Japanese embassy has started destroying its papers and records. Thank you. The Japanese envoys are still there. Why has Roosevelt stopped negotiating? He thinks he's holding all the cards. And logically, he's right. America's industrial capacity is ten times Japan's. Logic's the last thing that operates when national pride's involved. Especially with the Japanese. He's misjudging them, Jack. They commit suicide rather than lose face. It's our future that's at stake here, just as much as America's. Yes, I'm holding on. And we're not even told what's going on. Roosevelt thinks we're still a colony of England, so our cables go straight into the nearest dusty pigeonhole. Well, it's about time we stopped accepting that. Tell Casey to make a total bloody nuisance of himself until they let him see Roosevelt. As I said before, Mr. Casey, we really do appreciate your country's position, but we cannot allow Japan to occupy China, which is virtually what they're demanding. You've got to see it from our point of view, Mr. President. You Americans are the ones who are making all the demands on the Japanese. Japan has invaded China, Mr. Casey. Unprovoked aggression. They are bombing defenseless Chinese cities, women and children. We are not making demands. We're simply insisting they start behaving like a civilized nation before we resume supplying them with petrol and oil. All right. I'll rephrase that. You're the ones negotiating with Japan, but as I understand it, if the negotiations break down and Japan strikes out, there's no guarantee that the United States will declare war. Only Congress can declare war, Mr. Casey. I have no powers in that regard. Mr. Casey, the President and I don't want Japan to get away with any further aggression. But if they choose not to strike at American territory, Congress may not decide to jump. If your Congress doesn't jump, and Japan launches into war in the South Pacific, Australia is in a very vulnerable position indeed. We understand that, Mr. Casey. If the Japanese embassy has started to destroy sensitive material... Mr. Casey, there is an inference in what you are saying. Uh, we are being stubborn with the Japanese. Well, the truth is, all our intelligence points to the fact that they have decided on war months ago. Now, the talks are a total stalemate. They are. May I have your permission to approach the Japanese envoy personally? Of course. None of us wants war, Mr. Casey. General. Have seen Kurusu. Japan and the United States are locked into total stalemate. It would be prudent of you to assume that war is inevitable. If the Japs attack neutral ground, like the Dutch East Indies, there's no guarantee the Americans or the British should do anything about it. We'd better find out where Churchill stands. We will declare war on Japan if she attacks British territory. Otherwise, we wait for America. If America doesn't come in, Britain won't come in, and we have the Japanese army on our doorstep. And what we're left with is Churchill's assurance that if we're massively invaded, they'll drop everything in the Middle East and come to our aid. That's not worth the paper it's printed on. It didn't get as far as being printed. What would the Japs have to do to guarantee the Americans do come in? Bomb Washington. Hey, 
Japanese expedition is on the move. Until we know where it's headed, I'll stay in Melbourne. Make sure everyone can be contacted. Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor and Manila. No details beyond that. Pearl Harbor? Hawaii? The Japs must be out of their senses. At least there's no doubt now that America's involved. Do you have any more details? They've landed on the east coast of Malaya as well. That means the British are in the too. Thank God for that. Mm. Jack? It's Malaya. It means Britain's in too. Speaking. Can you repeat that? Thank you. The Japanese have wiped out the American Pacific Fleet. Jesus, no, that can't be right. Fred, I want all leave cancelled for all forces. Put all emergency measures into operation. We've only got ourselves to blame. We totally underestimated the Japanese. All the signs were there. Frank, just go back to your room and pack your bags. But even a blind man can see it. We've got to mobilise immediately. Prepare for guerrilla warfare. Everyone. Man, woman, child. Frank, they're not here yet. That's just the sort of thinking that got us into this mess in the first place. Men and women of Australia. We are at war with Japan. Japanese naval and air forces have launched an unprovoked attack on British and United States territory, striking ruthlessly like assassins in the night. For the first time in the history of the Pacific, armed conflict stalks abroad. We here, in this spacious land, where for more than 150 years, peace and security have prevailed, are now called upon to meet the external aggressor. This situation is not critical. As long as Singapore holds firm, there's no cause for immediate concern. Prime Minister, could I have a quick word with you? Uh, take a seat, Vernon. Wait a second. I'm sorry, Jack, but the military really have to be pulled into line. This isn't just another battle. It's a new war. Vernon, I think we could be facing something pretty serious. Our fully trained and equipped forces are in the Middle East and Malaya, and our five divisions here have no air cover. They'd be crushed by a well-planned Japanese attack. We saw that in Greece. You're assuming Singapore will fall. I'm assuming Singapore could fall, in which case we have to start planning for the possibility of a direct invasion of the mainland. Our boys are falling back. They're all falling back. The Japanese are advancing down the Malay Peninsula at a rate we just couldn't have anticipated. Our men can't hold the line against Japs. Without air cover, even the best soldiers are vulnerable. So, the Japs are streaming down towards Singapore through the jungles the British told us were impassable. It was always clear that the Japanese would have temporary naval and air superiority in the area. That situation will change as soon as the British fleet arrives. The British fleet won't arrive. The Japs have sunk the Repulse and the Prince of Wales. When? 1.30 Singapore time. No naval engagement. All the damage was done by those technically inferior planes of theirs. How quickly can we get a division out of the Middle East? Six weeks? Eight weeks. Possibly ten.
Churchill's arrived in Washington. Big conference with Roosevelt, apparently. I hope strengthening Singapore's up near the top of their agenda. Can't we get Casey in there as an observer? He's already asked, and they've refused. I don't expect them to treat us as an equal, but they've got to start accepting that we're an important ally with a right to know what the hell is going on. If Singapore falls, it's not Britain or America who have to worry, it's us. Casey! I told Curtin three days ago I was sending reinforcements to Singapore. I'm drowning in his bloody cables. Curtin says the troops you've dispatched are completely inadequate. We want some of our troops back from the Middle East. Well, you can't have them, Casey. You can't have them. We've got Rommel on the run over there. Victory is within our grasp. Why is Curtin making such a fuss? Singapore is a fortress. I've told him that a thousand times. No, no. With due respect, you also told us that the Japanese weren't up to the fighting standard of the Italians? Look, do you think I'm happy about what's going on in Malaya? I simply have no more troops, no more planes, no more any bloody thing. Casey! You can't kick me around. I'm not kickable. What the hell does it matter if he beats Rommel, if we're going to be overrun by Japs? If we want to bring our troops back from the Middle East, we'll bring them back. I don't care what kind of shipping difficulties he's got. The cables from Singapore are telling us that the troops are demoralized, the defense is inadequate, and all we get back from Churchill is Singapore will hold. In the Great War, Anzac troops copped the highest rate of casualties of any country involved. We send our troops off again, and what do we get back when we need it? Nothing. The truth is, the only country that's going to get us out of this is America. That's right, and it's time someone said so. Without any inhibitions of any kind, I make it quite clear that Australia looks to America free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with the United Kingdom. Taken to our heritage like a madman with an axe. We know that Australia can go, and Britain still hold on. Well, if that's what the Australian people feel, they can go to hell. I'm certain it's not what they really feel. I'm sure that the great bulk of them would be totally loyal to the Crown. We've been bombed nearly out of existence, Anthony. And the moment they're so much as threatened, they panic. Poor stock, Anthony. Blood without. They have got a national broadcasting service, haven't they? I believe so, yes. I'm going to arrange to address the Australian people directly. Winston, I really don't think that would be wise. Mr. Casey, if the purpose of Mr. Curtin's speech was to ingratiate his country with the United States, you can tell him from me that it has had just the opposite effect. His broadcast smacked of panic and damn it, disloyalty. And it has given our enemies the opportunity to make propaganda out of our disunity. Now, Mr. Churchill and I We'll take careful note of Australia's position in our discussions, and we will do our utmost to safeguard her interests. But appeals of this kind can only be totally counterproductive. Our present government, I'm afraid, is a little inexperienced at an international level. Uh, Mr. President, when will the new strategies for the Pacific become available? My government is naturally quite anxious. Mr. Churchill and I are working on our combined global strategy night and day. Your government will be notified as soon as our plans are finalized. The American people will not tolerate a half-hearted war against the Japanese, Mr. President. 
After Pearl Harbor, they want blood. Churchill is extremely persuasive, Mr. President. We mustn't let him determine grand strategy. I have no intention of allowing our country to play second fiddle to anyone, General. <laughs> I think we sorted that one out in 1776. But Mr. Churchill's argument that Hitler is our most formidable foe is a very powerful one. The arguments on both sides are complex, and both sides have their merit. But I believe that despite the savagery of the Japanese attacks, America must retain a commitment to beat Hitler first. Considering the state of Australian panic, Mr. President, I think we should keep this decision strictly between ourselves. Pacific strategy. What strategy? It leaves us totally defenseless. The U.S. Navy is supposed to be responsible for the whole of the Pacific, east of the Philippines. And where is it? Old plan's been drawn up as if Australia didn't exist. What in the hell is going on? I would have thought the first thing the Americans would want to do would be to hit back at the Japs. But their whole Pacific strategy is totally defensive. Well, one thing's clear. Our boys are coming home from the Middle East. No more delays. If we can't hold Malaya, then we can't hold it. Get our men across the straits into Singapore. Tell Wavell to prepare for a long siege. Prime Minister, you are aware that our defenses against a land-based attack across the straits are weak. What are you telling me? Well, I'm telling you what we've been saying since 1937 that Singapore's defenses are positioned to withstand a naval attack only. When have I been told that? I've never been told that. How could anyone design a fortress that could only be defended from the sea? It's like launching a battleship without a bottom. When was I told that? Just about every report since... Report? When did just one of you come up and tell me to my face? Did I bury something as vital as that in a report? This will be one of the greatest scandals in British history. Cable Wavell immediately and tell him to take every pick and shovel on that island and fortify the straits. Singapore must be converted into a fortress and defended to the death. No surrender will be contemplated. Being totally realistic about it, Anthony, if Singapore is going to fall, it makes no sense to leave our troops there to be captured. National pride shouldn't blind us to the fact that they'd be more used to us in Burma than in a Japanese prison camp, or worse. Sound out the chiefs of staff as to the feasibility of getting them out of there. There are two Australian battalions cut off on the peninsula. It may appear as if we're deserting them. It's an ugly decision. But we can't throw away men who could be used to fight on in Burma. This is a rat act. A trial. Just about as far as you can go. We've been told for years this was the one place that was going to be made impregnable. It's inexcusable. Now they want to shoot through and leave our boys in the jungle. Shoot and get a cable together on this one. Church was going to have the bucket tipped on him this time. Mm, it's not nearly tough enough. We've got to dish him up as good as he serves. Inexcusable betrayal. It's highly provocative, Dr. Ellis. I'd have to check the phrasing with the Prime Minister. Jack's in Perth. I make every allowance for the state of their anxiety, but to charge me with inexcusable betrayal is incredibly insolent. They've said they're going to look to America. Perhaps they'd better start doing just that. If they're going to keep squealing, I'll pull every last one of them out of the fighting zones and pack them all off home. Let them look to America. They won't do any better than they have with us, I can assure you of that. Roosevelt's got no time for squealers either. I 
Ireland keep our men in Singapore. And if they're lost, then it'd be on Curtin's head. Singapore can be described as Australia's Dunkirk. It will be recalled that the fall of Dunkirk initiated the battle for Britain. The fall of Singapore opens the battle for Australia. Fifteen thousand of our best fighting men, gone, sitting in prison camps. If they're still alive. Thank Christ we've got the 6th and 7th coming home. They've got to make it here yet. Brooke Popham lied to us. Churchill lied to us. It's a bloody sellout. We've been screaming at Churchill to do something about it for years. They didn't give us the aircraft. They didn't give us the supplies. And where's the pride of the Empire, the bloody British fleet? Too scared to poke its nose outside the Mediterranean. We have to face up to it. We're not exactly blameless ourselves. Ah, oh, come on, Jack. They've sold us out. Years we've been saying we're not a colony. The first hint of threat, we panic. So let's get off our backsides and do something about it. Right, we've got to get out of this one ourselves. We can start by calling up every available man for home defense. Yeah, and any bastard caught away from his workplace without an excuse is going straight into the militia. Can you turn it up? The Russians have had it far worse than we have, Eddie. We've got to be prepared to make the sort of sacrifices they're making. Like what? Uh, you keep giving invasion warnings to the press, you'll panic everybody. Look, they've got Rebel, they're bombing Port Moresby, they're on our bloody doorstep. The ship's right, Frank, just lay off. People are streaming south out of Queensland, and city people are starting to head for the hills. Yeah. We'll end up with our entire population out in the desert. You want us to be totally unprepared? You're doing a great job, Frank, but people are a bit crook on you, taking down street signs and confiscating maps. Do you want them driving their tanks straight up the main street of every suburban town? Without a street sign or map in the whole country, we're all going to lose our way before the bloody Japs get here. Well then, Prime Minister. Mr Ford is very concerned about this line you've apparently drawn on the map about Brisbane. We were asked to draw up a defence plan to cope with a possible invasion and told that South East Australia had priority. With only 300,000 poorly trained conscripts to defend the mainland, perhaps you could show us how we could do better. I won't have a bar of any plan that leaves North Queensland defenceless. It might be something to do with the fact that she's electric. Minister, with the men and equipment we've got, we'd be very lucky to hold Melbourne. In my opinion, Lieutenant General Mackay hasn't been ruthless enough. I'd be inclined to move what troops we do have from the outlying areas straight to the eastern seaboard. I don't care what the difficulties are. All of Australia's got to be protected. With what, Minister? Well, we've got two divisions coming home from the Middle East. They may not get here in time. I'm afraid I have to agree with Mr Ford. Your defence plan is very negative, to say the least. We are virtually conceding half the country to the Japs. Prime Minister, find me the men and equipment, and I'll gladly come up with a more optimistic view. Assume we are going to get American aid and plan on that basis. I can only plan with what I have at hand. I appreciate your honesty, General. But we can't endorse any plan that even contemplates abandoning any region of Australia. What's their secret, George? The Japs? 
Damned if I know. Do we have an intelligence organization worthy of the name? Or are we being informed by idiots? Well, in all fairness, it would have been difficult for anyone to have predicted how efficient they were going to be. Why? Why was it so difficult? Hmm? They've been fighting for years in China. Why couldn't we have learned from that? China was China. The real... The real reason our intelligence underestimated them, George, was because their skins weren't white. Well, weren't we all a little guilty of that, hmm? Burma, George. We have to save Burma. Well, Churchill says he's got no troops in the area. Well, damn Japs close the Burma road. We cannot supply China. China collapses, it'll free 20 Japanese divisions for the Pacific. But does Churchill realize that? I mean, we'd have to pull out of Europe and concentrate on the Pacific. Does he understand that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure he does. Well, point it out to him. Just in case he hasn't made the connection. Point it out to him. Maybe he'll try a little harder. Roosevelt can't expect me to pluck a couple of divisions out of the air. Have you considered the Australian 7th Division? Where are they now? Somewhere in the Indian Ocean. They're about here. Well, they could be in Burma in a couple of days. We'd only need them for a month or so until we can put our own troops in. that will solve everything. The only problem is, how do we convince the Australians? I knew this would happen. Ever since you took over, you've been driving yourself into the ground. I'm going to call a doctor straight away and you're going to hospital for a rest. Can't rest now. There's a million things to be done. And most of them will work themselves out without your divine intervention. Look, I'll be all right once the troop ships get home. They'll get here. You reckon? Every Jap submarine in creation is probably out looking for them. Worrying yourself sick isn't going to help. Well, I ordered them home. If anything happened, it's my fault. Jack, you brought them home because you had to bring them home. I've started having nightmares, Nip. I see the shape of the ships in the dark. Flames lighting up the sky. Men jumping up. They'll get here safe and sound. Don't worry about that. Come on. I'm going to call the doctor and you're going into hospital where nobody can get at you for a day or two. Are you going? No arguments. A problem has arisen in which you could be an immense help to me. The situation in Burma has become critical, and your 7th Division is the only Allied force we have in the area. If you could let us have them just for a month or so until British reinforcements arrive. Most immediate. For the Prime Minister, personal, himself only, most secret. In my view, it is essential. We should agree with Churchill's request that 7th Australian Division, now en route to Australia, be diverted to Burma. The continuance of a flow of supplies and munitions to China is of paramount importance for the fight against Japan. What is Bruce doing over there? Hasn't it penetrated his thick skull? We're just about to be invaded. That's not Bruce speaking, that's Churchill. Whoever's speaking, tell him the convoy's not going to Burma, it's coming home.
What news, Bruce? I can't stress too strongly how critical the situation in Burma is. China is the key to the whole of Asia. And if the Burma road goes, China goes. There's still some confusion at home, Prime Minister. I'll keep pressing them for an answer. It is reprehensible for the Labour members of this council to suggest that Bruce is Churchill's mouthpiece. As he points out in his cable, the Burma Road and China are crucial in the fight against Japan, and anyone who denies this is being completely insular. Mr. Churchill has assured him that the arrangements are temporary, and that British troops and planes will be sent to the area almost immediately. Like they were in Singapore? The Japs have bombed Darwin! The 7th Division proceeds to Australia. I will tender my resignation. I'm very much afraid they're not going to change their minds, Winston. They want the 7th Division home. Churchill is behaving like a willful and stubborn child. Darwin bombed. The whole of England has been bombed. The longer we leave it, the further the Australian convoy gets from Burma. The urgency of the situation has been repeatedly stressed to Curtin by both Roosevelt and myself. It's like talking to a deaf man. If every dominion has got to go on its own merry way, then what hope have we got in a cohesive worldwide strategy? The time has come, gentlemen, for Mr. Curtin to learn a lesson or two. He is governing with a majority of one, without the support of the business and civic leaders of his nation. And he is not going to be allowed to repeat the cowardice he displayed over to Brooke. Yeah. Tell Admiralty to order the convoy to change course towards Burma. Do you think it's wise to order the convoy to Burma without Curtin's consent, sir? I'm past caring whether it's wise or unwise. I'm just going to do it. Are you going to tell him? No. Not until it's too late for him to do anything about it. Are you going to tell Roosevelt? I'm going to tell no one. Mr. Casey, does your Prime Minister realize that if Burma falls, our whole Asian position, including that of Australia, will be severely strained? Yes, Mr. President. I know the Japs are moving very fast, but I don't believe any of your vital centers are in any immediate danger. I'm afraid my government does not share that view, sir. I've already authorized the sending of the American 41st Division to your country. Presumably, your government is aware of that fact. It can't arrive until late April or May, Sam. Our military advisors think we could be facing an invasion by then. Mr. Casey, I want you to tell Mr. Curtin from me that in my opinion, the security of Burma is of paramount importance and I want you to urge him to change his mind. Mr. You President... You can do it, Mr. Casey. All our intelligence information points to the Japanese having a total air control over the Bay of Bengal. So it's highly doubtful we can land the troops in Burma, let alone get them out again. To top it off, all the weapons and equipment are on another part of the convoy. What? So even if we do get them ashore, they won't be armed. Sounds like the makings of another Gallipoli. You can do it to us once, Jack. We're not going to be the mugs the second time around. Get everyone together. Churchill's always going to be hostile to us because we're a Labour government. So we'd better learn to stand up to him now because it's not going to get any easier. Churchill's led us from one disaster to another. Greece, Crete, Malaya, Singapore. We've got to stand up to him now. Malaya, Singapore and Timor have been lost. And the enemy has begun raiding our own territory. 
We feel in view of the foregoing and in view of the services we have rendered you in the Middle East that we have every right to bring our troops home. See how they like this. We could not contemplate that you would refuse our request and that of the President of the United States. We have therefore decided that the convoy should be temporarily diverted to the northward. The convoy is now too far north for some of the ships in it to reach Australia without refueling. These physical considerations give you a few days to review the position should you wish to do so. Don't forget that they're governing with a one-vote majority. If he gets away with this, we might as well turn the clock back a hundred years, dissolve Parliament, and let the Governor-General rule by decree. You must know he can't do this. He's telling us we have no right to control our own army. I'm going to really rip the bastard apart. I'll draft the cable this time, Bert. Just leave me for half an hour, will you, while I calm down and think. Most immediate. Most secret. It appears that you have diverted the convoy towards Rangoon. And have treated our approval of this vital diversion as merely a matter of form. Australia's outer defences are quickly vanishing. And our vulnerability is completely exposed. In these circumstances, it is quite impossible for us to reverse a decision which we made with the utmost care and which we have affirmed and reaffirmed. Tell Curtin the convoy is now proceeding to Colombo to refuel. It will then proceed to Australia in accordance with his wishes. Our enemies must be delighted, George. This brawl between Curtin and Churchill is in every newspaper from coast to coast. Well, the Australians are pretty jumpy. <sighs> They've been that way ever since the fall of Singapore. Tell me, are they in any real danger? I'd say so. Mm. Well, the Japs didn't plan on invading them at the outset, but everything's gone so easily for them that sure as hell they're thinking about it now. But why the hell don't the British do something about the it? British? It's a British it's colony, isn't it? Dominion. Dominion. Whatever. Well, the British are up to their necks. Mm. Their attitude, to be quite frank, is that whether or not the Japs have Australia and New Zealand's going to make damn all difference to the outcome of the war. I promise, Curtin. An American division. Now, if they're going to be invaded... If they're going to be invaded, it's not enough. We either send nothing or do the job properly. I mean, what do we stand to gain, strategically, if we do save them? The Australians, I mean. Well, some of our strategists think it's a good base for an eventual counterattack. What do you think? Oh, I, I, I'm not convinced. We've got perfectly workable plans drawn up to have our outer defense perimeter end at Hawaii. Yeah. That's our own backyard, George. Exactly. I hate to think of Australia going under. The Jap is a pretty uncivilized conqueror. But we have to ask ourselves, is a major effort justified? Is it worth it, politically, militarily, or strategically? Well, I, I'm in two minds, Mr. President. I mean, we've committed ourselves to beating the Germans first. On the other hand, I just don't like to hand the enemy a nation of seven million white people. Mm. I think we should send them another division. And MacArthur. General Douglas MacArthur? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. He's a pain in the ass. But I still think he's too good a general to lose. Yes. I think he's intent upon dying a martyr's death in the Philippines. <laughs> and you know something, George? Huh. I'm inclined to let him. <laughs> <laughs>
direct order of the president. I don't care if it's a direct order from God. Men are still going to think I'm running out of them. You can play your war game outside, young man. Old. Young old. If you don't go, you'll be court martial. I'm a soldier's wife, and I'm prepared to stay to the end. But if there is an army waiting for you in Australia, you might be able to lead them back here in time. There's no army waiting for me in Australia. It's just Marshall and the rest of his desk soldiers dangling the carrot. And I'm not going to bite. How can I leave? There could be a force waiting for you in Australia. Jack's looking very tired. He hasn't slept a wink. And I don't think he will until those troop ships get home. They'll be all right, Jack. If anything happened to them... I wouldn't want to live. Yes? Thank you. Now, will you get some sleep? I can't defy presidential orders, Dick. Marshall tells me there's a force being gathered in Australia. I must assume that's true. There's not much hope for us here. If there is a force down there, General, then it is possible you could get it back here in time. A lot of organization. I never leave here unless my men know and understand that I was coming back. A lot of organization. If I took a hand-picked selection of my best officers, we could whip what is down there in Australia into fighting shape in no time at all. Marshall's only authorized you and your family to go, hasn't he? I go. All my family go. Well, just answer me this, Mr. Prime Minister. Is it right and proper that the Australian waterside workers, who are refusing to work overtime and give us the benefit of the miserable dribble of supplies we so desperately need, are not arrested and jailed for the traitors that they are. I've instructed Mr. Healy of the Waterside Workers' Federation to discuss the whole question with me. Discuss? Good God, man! Our last two willoughways were shot to pieces this morning, leaving us with no fighting aircraft whatsoever and three million square miles of territory to defend. And your strongest promise to us, Mr. Prime Minister, is that you will talk to Mr. Healy. He should be strung up. If talk proves fruitless, I'll take stronger measures. They should all be strung up. In a time of acute labour shortage, Billy, I don't think hanging's the answer. Excuse me, gentlemen. Where the bloody hell are you off to? Hello? Prime Minister? General George Marshall. How are you, General? Fine, thank you, sir. President Roosevelt presents his compliments, Prime Minister. And as director that I inform you that General Douglas MacArthur, United States Army, has today arrived from the Philippine Islands. In Australia? The President expresses his regret that he's been unable to inform you of General MacArthur's pending arrival. The president suggests that it would be highly acceptable to him and pleasing to the American people for the Australian government to nominate General MacArthur as supreme commander of all Allied forces in the Southwest Pacific. Beep. Beep.
news is not good, General. Well, I was under no illusion there was a vast army assembled here, but I was hoping that what was here would be enough to weld into an effective striking force. We have 32,000 Allied troops and less than 100 aircraft. That's including the gypsy moths. Scarcely enough to hold this country, let alone mount an offensive. And I sit here in the wilderness while my men on Bataan die, wondering why I never came back. Roosevelt and Marshall have made me look like a fool and a coward. The whole country sounds as if it's in a complete shambles. It won't be for long. I'll soon knock it into shape. The first thing you've got to do is stop this bloody nonsense. Conscripts for home. Volunteers abroad. MacArthur's in Australia. Douglas MacArthur. He's been appointed Supreme Commander of all Allied forces in the South Pacific. Best thing that could have happened for Australia. He's so far away from his own government, he won't have any interference from him. As far as our government's concerned, he won't take any notice of him. General, I've gone over all the intelligence reports I could lay my hands on, and uh, this ain't going to be no picnic. Listen to this. The average Australian has no conception of the limitations of his country. The causes are easy to find. First, they will not tell each other the truth. Second, they have a low standard of education and know little of the world. The general standard of honesty of the people is of a low order, and this ranges from the politician to the war fiend. Longshoremen take their lunches on board the ships in suitcases and stagger off with them full of stolen supplies. They call them lunch baskets. Why isn't anyone stopping them? The police seem to be in on the whole deal. Listen to this. There's a fatalistic depression amongst the population that is almost solid. And if the Japs landed tomorrow, the great majority of Australians would just turn over and play dead. Well, they had a reputation of some of the toughest soldiers we had in the last war. What happened to them? Man for man, they're as brave and as tough as anyone. But they tend to be hell raisers and individualists, not used to discipline. Many socialists working on them. Honored to serve with Australian soldiers in World War One, and proud to be their comrade once more. I was ordered by the President of the United States to break through the Japanese lines for the purpose of organizing an offensive against Japan, the primary object of which is the relief of the Philippines. I came through, and I shall return. a chance to watch their parliament in action as well, and uh, it's a real shock. 
They couldn't run an evening session last week because there'd been an afternoon reception where they consumed 36 bottles of whiskey and a vat of rum punch. What about Kurt? Well, he uh, can be very stubborn. I don't think there's any doubt that he's respected and liked. However, he knows next to nothing of military matters. And he allows the socialists in his party to do and say what they like. But he's a great admirer of yours, General. The minute you arrived in this country, he got on the phone to Washington and insisted you be made Commander-in-Chief. Minister, it is a delight and honor to meet you at last. From the reception you've been getting from all over the country, I don't think I need to tell you how welcome your presence is to all of us here. I'm delighted that our two great nations, of common ancestry and sharing common concerns, are now as brothers in this vital struggle for freedom. Mr. Prime Minister, you and I will see this through together. The question is, where are we going to fit into the scheme of things now? In the back seat. He's brought all his gang from Bataan. It's part of his brief that he has Australians on his staff. Even Washington's pushing that. What do you like with a wash bucket at Mark? Make no mistake, gentlemen. We're up against a formidable adversary. The Japanese Army, Navy, and Air Force, unlike ours, work as one machine. And the Japanese soldier is totally disciplined and fights with unparalleled ferocity. But I am convinced, however, that he can be beaten. Japanese is a front runner. His tight organization and detailed planning work perfectly as long as he is on the attack. It is a strategy that depends on his opponent's frailties and on quick, decisive victories. I also believe that his supply lines are on the point of overextended. If his supply lines are overextended, does it follow that he hasn't got the capacity to invade us? Well, strategically, I think that would be a blunder. But then I thought the Germans would rule out the invasion of Russia on strategic grounds, too. We are in danger, I'd like to know. Elsa and John and Gran are all in Perth, and Perth's so isolated it'll be a natural target. I heard Chiff say that the Queensland government wants to start evacuating its northern cities. You've got very big ears. Don't fob me off, Jack. What's the truth? Elsie, if the Americans were going to let Australia go under, they wouldn't have sent us their top general. We all know he's here, but where's his army? So that's all, Mr. President. The Russians are doing more damage to the Germans than all the rest of us put together. But they're taking one hell of a battering and are on the point of collapse. Now, if we don't invade Europe before the year's out, the Russians will go under, and the whole weight of the war will fall back on us. I am not being party to a policy that neglects the Pacific. A Russian cave-in would be catastrophic. Now, we made a commitment to Mr. Churchill to beat Hitler first, George, but are we ready to start a second front so soon? If we landed six divisions on the French coastline 
and reinforce them at the rate of 100,000 men a week. 100,000 men a week? We're so undermanned in the Pacific, the Japanese can attack at will. If we do not drastically strengthen Hawaii, we can lose that. We could lose Alaska. Australia is almost lost already. Oh, Ernest is not quite as desperate as that. George, there is nothing between the Japs and our West Coast. Unless we reinforce the Pacific, America itself is vulnerable. Anthony, don't get so agitated. Well, I know Marshall is confident his boys can do anything, but it takes two years of hard training and battle experience to make first-rate soldiers. Now, if, if the Americans make a frontal attack on Hitler this year, the Germans will annihilate them. There is no possibility of an Allied invasion of Europe in 1942. Then why don't you tell Marshall that? I don't want to dampen his enthusiasm. The more American divisions we have over here, the more of our men there are to spare for the Middle East. The Americans are going to be furious if we accept their troops and send ours to the Middle East. The prime imperial obligation at the moment is to protect the way into India. We cannot leave 400 million of His Majesty's Indian subjects to be ravaged and enslaved by the Jap. That would be dereliction of duty, which could cause me great shame. Rest assured, Dr. Abbott, I would not have sent General MacArthur down to you if I was not totally committed to your country's cause. I'd like to say, Mr. President, how gratifying it is for me to be able to hear that from you at first hand. I think I should be frank with you, however, and report that my government has some worries about the specifics of our relationship. Now, we feel that seeing as we're all in this together, and seeing that the very fate of our country depends on what's happening here in Washington, we have a right to be heard. Have you had time to look at my proposals for a Pacific War Council? Uh, not in detail, Dr. Abbott, but I can assure you they'll be given very close consideration. Mm. Well, secondly, while we're very grateful to have General MacArthur with us, I must report he's bitterly disappointed at the allocation of troops and equipment you've given him. He considers he's got barely enough to hold the country, let alone stage an offensive. And how long are you planning to be with us here in Washington, Dr. Abbott? Probably quite a while. any men or equipment, and that those desk soldiers back in Washington are doing nothing at all to improve the situation. The American press representatives over here know how upset you are, General. Well, who's over here? Anyone who's clout? The guy from Time magazine seems pretty sharp. I know how much you hate using the press to score points, General. But I believe we've almost reached the stage where you've got a duty to let the American people know how you feel. Hero on ice. <laughs> MacArthur thinks he can stampede me by running to the press. He's got another thing coming. He feels the situation is desperate. And let's be frank, the situation is desperate. Dr. Abbott, we have enormous demands made upon us for men and machines from critical battlefronts all around the world. Well, I'm totally aware of that, Mr. President. You're under enormous strain. But Australia's been getting next to nothing. You have six or seven divisions of your own, do you not? Five of them are militia divisions that are only partly trained. Nevertheless, you have six or seven divisions of your own. The troops are useless without air cover. It's one lesson we learned from Greece. Our chiefs of staff have told us that it'd take 25 divisions to defend Australia with the air force we've got at the moment. General MacArthur's even more pessimistic. He says that without planes, no amount of ground forces can repel the Japanese. But I... I was told... 
I was under the impression you had a thousand airplanes operational by now, Dr. Ebert. 503. Well, that can hardly be described as satisfactory, can it? We're a nation which, quite frankly, feels it has six weeks to live. I shall make every effort to see that you get a thousand airplanes and another American infantry division as quickly as is humanly possible. I'll drink to that, Mr. President. I find this difficult to comprehend, Mr. Shen. My government has finally given me my orders, and your government refuses to ratify them. I left my beleaguered fellow countrymen in the Philippines on the understanding that I would make every effort to relieve them. The situation there is disastrous, and it's worsening with every hour that passes. Now, if your government has any second thoughts about the wisdom of putting an American officer in command of its force, I am quite willing to confine my activities to the command of the American force. But I'm not prepared any longer to sit around and wait. If we sign this directive, it virtually makes MacArthur the dictator of Australia. That's stretching it a bit far, Eddie. Just let me read you one choice item. Commanders of all armed forces within your area will be immediately informed by their respective governments that orders and instructions issued by the Supreme Commander will be considered as emanating from their respective governments. I don't need a law degree to work out what that means. Absolute power. We've always got the right to deny him the use of our troops. Well, like we had with Churchill. Is there any truth in the story that he's asking for the right to censor the press? You all know the press can't go on like it is. Have got a right to know what's going on? The Japs don't need any spies. They read all they need to know on the front pages. You mean you're giving him total control of the military and the press? He is not getting total control of the press. Just the right to check military information. No one's been given this much power since Genghis Khan. General, the Australian government has ratified your directive. Now we can start organizing ourselves. <laughs> to worry. How we can get our command headquarters into shape. A marshal cabled again this morning. He's very anxious that you allocate some key positions to Australians. I didn't bring you boys out of Corregidor to have you sit on your butts taking orders from a bunch of colonial hicks. Come on, we've got a war to run. Not one Australian in the top 20 appointments. We see it as total humiliation. And we insist but you don't let him get away with it. I don't think that was his intention. It's just that he knows his own men and knows their capacities. I've had 10 times the frontline experience than he has. And so have the officers who've served with me in the Middle East. Who does he think he is? God, Christ, the Holy Ghost? You're the best soldier we've got, Tom. I'd resign myself before I accepted this. What's the use of me staying on? I've got a damn all to do. Tom, you're commander of Allied Land Forces. He is supreme commander of everything. If I want to say something to you, I have to go through him. If it ever gets to that level of formality, we'll all give up. If you want to say anything to me at any time, just pick up the phone like you did this morning. He's a difficult man, Tom. But he's got the reputation of a brilliant commander. And quite frankly, we need all the help we can get right now. Can you try and get along with him? It's important to all of us. Mr. President, we do not have enough ships. To take an American division to Australia effectively means three less divisions to England. Huh. Well, that means we can forget striking at Hitler until well into 1943. By well, then, the Russians may have collapsed, and we may be facing a war of 20 years' duration. Mr. President, you have always told me that you are wholeheartedly behind the principle that America should attack Hitler, and attack him soon. George, I made no definite promises to the Australians. Now, if these suggestions of mine conflict in any way with your plans, well, the Second Front, they will not be implemented. Well, they do conflict, very seriously. Churchill has given our plan his total support. Fine. 
fine. I've insured us we were getting a thousand planes and an infantry. Oh, where are they? Roosevelt has apparently changed his mind. No, it's not Roosevelt. It's Marshall. Don't they realize there's a whole Japanese army up there? They realize, but they don't care. It's British territory, not American. So there are no ties of sentiment or blood. Our ties with Britain aren't much use. They've got their own problems. So we'll have to do it all ourselves. Exactly. But the sooner we rid ourselves of this air of defeatism that surrounds us. There is no defeatism in my army. The defense plans, when I arrived, left the country north of Lisbon virtually undefended. When a country's only got a handful of men, and the best of them are overseas, you've got to concentrate the forces you do have around its vital centers. The history of warfare shows that it's useless to concentrate forces in front of a rapidly advancing enemy. So we must start thinking in terms of attack and strike at his weaknesses. And the obvious Japanese weaknesses are the length of his supply lines. They stretch over 2,000 miles of ocean. It's always been our intention to go on the attack when we got the manpower and the equipment, but seeing as we haven't and we're not likely to get it, we plan for the time when we will have the men and equipment. You've just conceded, General, that there's little hope of us getting men and equipment. So what is the use of making all these grandiose plans? Thank you, General Blamey. I'll notify you if we require you again. Am I to understand from that that I'm to be excluded from these war conferences from here on in? Your Prime Minister has agreed that I deal directly with him. Directly. Tom, I've already assured you, you can sit down with me and discuss things at any time. The difference is, Mr. Prime Minister, that when you and I sit down, we don't make any big decisions. General, you'll always be invited to join us if the occasion warrants. There are five Australian soldiers to every one of theirs. You just as good as silenced your last Australian voice. Tom, I'm an Australian. There's a bit of concern amongst the ranks. About MacArthur? I know. Tom's convinced I've sold him out, and Ward's convinced I've sold the country out. It's just the feeling that he could have stood up a bit more for Tom. You read the Rebel reports, Ben. You know what we're facing. Unless I get MacArthur 100% behind us, we stand a bloody good chance of going under. Tom's got about as much tact as a Brisbane barmaid. <laughs> he hasn't exactly got a silver tongue. I won't let MacArthur get out of hand. But for the moment, I think it's vital that he feels he's got my confidence. It's an invasion fleet. The Navy code breaker said there's absolutely no doubt. The Navy has a habit of getting things wrong. The question now is, do we believe them when they tell us it's heading to Moresby? Or are they coming here? Eleven transports, three cruisers, an aircraft carrier, and four other heavy cruisers. I hate to say it, but I hope it is Moresby. Where are our ships? Round about here. Well, they know who they're fighting, what they're fighting, where they are. Now let us pray to God they blast that fleet right out of the ocean. I have received a communique from General MacArthur stating that a great naval battle is proceeding in the southwest Pacific zone. The events which are taking place today are of crucial importance to the conduct of the war in this theater. I ask the people of Australia, having regard to the grave consequences implicit in this engagement, to 
to make a sober and realistic appraisal of their duty to the nation. This is today the front line. I put it to any man whom my words may reach that he owes it to those men out there fighting for the security of this territory not to be stinting in what he will now do for Australia. The thing that we all dread, of course, and have been dreading for some time, is that the Japanese will move westward into India and link themselves with the Germans in the Middle East. I am pleased to report that our concentration of aircraft carriers in the Indian Ocean is now formidable enough to force the Japanese to operate on the Pacific side of Singapore. Well, you must realize, Prime Minister, that this considerably increases the danger to Australia. I'm sorry to break in like this, but I've been sitting here all night waiting for someone to mention that there's a naval battle proceeding in the Coral Sea, which is crucial to the fate of Australia. Dr. Abbott, I have time and time again laid down the following principle to Australia and New Zealand that if Japan set about invading Australia and New Zealand on a large scale, we would cut our losses and proceed to your aid, sacrificing every interest. And we have time and time again pointed out that Parliament and the British people would never allow you to do this. And even if they did, by the time you got there, it'd be too late. We can't accept vague assurances any longer. If you prefer to safeguard India, which is under remote threat, to Australia, which is under severe threat, you are betraying a nation that sacrificed 60,000 of its men for you in the last war and has given you all the assistance it humanly can in this war. And if you do that, history will indict you. Planes seem to be your most pressing need at the moment. Hmm? Spitfires and the pilots to fly them. Why is it all taking so long? It's a new type of battle. All the fighting's been done by planes, and the planes have to find the ships. And well, it takes time. I'm sorry, but you married a warrior. I've always been a warrior, and there's nothing much I can do about it. I worry about every boy that's killed out there because I know what it's going to do to their families. The country should be run by someone with steel nerves at a time like this. Like Churchill. The more bombs that are dropping around him, the better he seems to like it. was not a great victory. It was simply a stay of execution. And Washington and London must be made to see that. We knew the enemy's concentration. We knew his intentions. We knew the prospective date of his attack, yet we couldn't defeat him. The whole of his convoy, 24 troop transports, got back to Rabaul unscathed and his main naval force is still intact. He's secured for himself all the oil and tin and rubber he needs. And the defeat in the Philippines has freed his forces to attack elsewhere. There's a Japanese army up there looking for somewhere to go. And their navy is still by far the most formidable in the Pacific. What's their next move then, General? God knows. They could strike anywhere between here and the west coast of America.
All we know for certain at the moment is that there is a huge Japanese fleet somewhere out there in the Pacific, and it's on the move. What the hell are our code breakers doing? They've been working round the clock, but the Japanese are keeping radio signals to a minimum. They don't have a lot to work on. I can't believe the Jap would be crazy enough to head for California. I think it's more possible that they aim to totally cut our sea route in the South Pacific. Fiji, Samoa, New Caledonia, totally isolate Australia. That leaves us Hawaii. If we can hold it. We cannot rule out the possibility that it's going to be Pearl Harbor all over again. It's Midway, June 4th. carriers. They can't cut out Australia now. Dick, this is the turn of the tide. Today we start winning ourselves a war. With you all the way, General. Marshall will give me troops and amphibious craft. We'll knock out Rabaul. Rabaul? There are more Japs there than in Tokyo. The Japs got where they are by taking risks. The King will allocate me Marines for a beachhead. I'll need three army divisions. 31st, the 42nd, and possibly one Australian. Could you rely on the Australians? I'm going to have to. The only fighting they seem to do is beating up our guys. Can you sell an operation like this to Marshall? Watch him. Marshall and Churchill have just had a brawl, and his interest in the Pacific has suddenly increased. MacArthur is as transparent as that wind. He wants to take over the entire Pacific operation. I want some action in the Pacific, Ernest. Churchill never had any intention of starting a second front this year, so we can take the consequences. There is no way I am giving that megalomaniac MacArthur command of my fleet. His plan could work. If we could get the Japs out of Rabaul, they'd be driven back 700 miles. I wish you would stop referring to it as MacArthur's plan. Our boys had a similar plan under discussion. Give the man with... some credit. He gives himself more than enough. We can handle this thing without MacArthur. And that is what we intend to do with or without your consent. God damn it, who is this war between us and the Japs or the U.S. Army and Navy? Ernest, if we can work together on this, we'd be 700 miles closer to Tokyo. We're on the move at last. Admiral King is on the move. He's given himself the entire first stage of the operation. You'll be the one who takes her bow. Her bow is just the start date. It's the Philippines I want. If I don't make good on my promise to return, I've let down a lot of people who trusted me. And whom I loved. And history will have every right to regard my retreat from Bataan as an act of cowardice. I know there have been some minor frictions in the past, General, and that's why I wanted to let you know personally what I've already told the War Council. Namely, that I'm extremely gratified at the progress you've made in reorganizing your army. That's the job I'm paid to do. General, it's always been central to my thinking that we be as bold and as decisive as our enemy. I 
I think we are now in a position where we can be. I want to go on the attack. So do I. We're moving at last, General, and I want you and your men to be part of it. What's the plan? We're looking at a full-scale assault on Rabaul. Well, that's a tall order. Was it beyond your men's capacity? My men can do anything within reason. But Rabaul is a tough nut to crack right now. It's the biggest Jap base in the Pacific. I'll be fighting alongside the best Marines we've got and supported by two infantry divisions. This is going to be our first major victory over the Japanese, and I want you Australians to be part of it. Well, Curtin wants the 7th Division up in New Guinea, defending Port Moresby. There's no danger. Tell that to Kirk. The Japs would have to come down over the Owen Stanley Ranges to get to Moresby. And my information is that they're totally impenetrable. You know, for the first time since we left Corregidor, we're headed north again. It's symbolic. This move marks a whole new phase. We're getting reports of a large enemy convoy movement north of New Guinea. Headed for where? Possibly Buna. Australian intelligence thinks it could be a full-scale invasion force, but that doesn't make any sense. It sure doesn't. They'd never make it down across the Owen Stanleys. They could be trying to establish an air base. Get some Australians up there. Flush them out. Australian intelligence. When they couldn't catch a Borneo by the sea, they came round the back way and went through the jungle. Buggers could be headed for Port Moresby. But if they get Port Moresby, they can bomb the whole of North Australia into rubble. It wouldn't make any sense. How would they ever get past the Owen Stanley's? I don't region? know how they'd get past the bloody Owen Stanley's, but you don't put 10,000 men ashore to build an airstrip. And I'm telling you, if they are coming over the Owen Stanley's, we have only got two militia brigades there in Moresby waiting for them. And by Christ, there are going to be some questions asked about that. My feeling is that we should play safe and get the 7th up there straight away. Your 7th is training for Rabaul. I'm not about to panic on the basis of what our intelligence tells us is a minor. The Australian 39th Battalion is retreating back to Kokoda. What sort of soldiers are they? They appear to be in full retreat and total disarray. There are a handful of Japs moving along a narrow trail. Now, one man with a shotgun could stop them. Sir. Admiral King. If Moresby falls, the situation in the Southwest Pacific could become critical. What in God's name makes him think more is going to fall? It's a temporary and minor Japanese encouragement. The Australian soldiers were falling back, not ours. Does he know that? No, sir. I don't know, sir. Well, let him know that, Dick. Yes, sir. He'll want to know exactly what we're doing about the situation. We're moving to stem the Japanese advance. What does he imagine we're doing? If I tell him that, He'll ask for specific details. You know what he's like. Tell him we're sending more Australians up for more. There are only two brigades stationed there, General. And the seventh. 
Madam, we're sending the Australian Sevens. Murdoch! Come on, fellas, we need help with the wounded at the start. I'm not sending one more man of mine up into that trail until something's done about supply. The reserve supplies they told me were up there aren't. I sent men up at a freezing altitude in shorts without blinks. I'm just afraid we'll lose half of them before they even get to the Japs. Well, the thing I've been asking myself is, why not let the Japs come to us? Let them have all the supply line problems. Because someone needs a victory in the Pacific, a lot of our men are going to have to die to provide them. American commander allowed a retreat like this, he would have been relieved immediately. This 7th Division is supposed to be their best. God help us. What we've got here is worse than disorganization. It's cowardice. Our boys would have had more pride than let themselves be routed by a handful of Japs. You can't be held responsible for Australian incompetence. Well, I am responsible. I'm the Supreme Commander. My mistake was to let Blaney command the land force. Why didn't MacArthur reinforce Moresby months ago? It's criminal neglect. No one foresaw they'd come down the Owen Stanleys. I could see what they were up to weeks ago. MacArthur's made a bloody great blunder, and we should say so. We all treat him as if he was a tin god. The important thing, Tom, is whether Raoul is going to be able to hold Moresby. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Sid will do the job he was sent up there to do. John, I'm sorry to call you on such short notice, but the situation is critical. Your soldiers are falling back, and Morrisby's under severe threat. The Japs are within 25 miles. I've had a cable from Marshall saying the situation in the Solomons is critical. I've had to reply that I couldn't send him any aid because uh, our situation is just as perilous. Well, General Blamey's confident we're going to hold. Well, I don't share that confidence. And to be totally blunt, I no longer have any confidence in General Blamey. Your troops don't even seem to have the determination or the inclination to take the battle to the enemy, which is something I find difficult to understand. I want you to order Blamey to Moresby immediately to see if he can organize the situation. I'm sending up two American divisions under the command of General Eichelberger. General Eichelberger is to report directly to me. I wish to propose a resolution that in view of the crucial defense situation facing Australia at this moment, the Defense Act be changed to allow us to send militia to fight in areas outside Australia. Deemed to be crucial to the defense of this country. That conscription, that motion is not on the agenda. Japan's attack isn't on the agenda paper either. This is a fundamental betrayal of deeply held labor principles. We will never tolerate the export of men for slaughter. We fought for that principle in the last war. What's wrong with you, Jack? You went to jail supporting that. Who are you taking orders from, Jack? Barracks. Let's have some quiet and give Jack a fair hearing. My position as a labor man is clear. My opposition to war is total, and my abhorrence of conscription is in no way diminished. But I fail to see how we can expect American draftees fight and die for us when only a portion of our own forces are legally able to share the sacrifice with them. I don't like conscription any more than you do, but thank Christ you won today. If we don't fight them up there, we'll be fighting them down here. Well done, comrade. Go yourself. 
every Eddie Ward, there's a dozen other Australians who know you've done the right thing. Yeah? Well, I wish some of them would tell me occasionally. All you ever get to hear in this job are the Eddie Wards. My father said you don't go into politics if you want an easy life. He didn't even get elected. Wasn't he lucky? quietly because something's bound to go wrong, but I think we've stopped the bastards. On Emitai Ridge? We've thrown back every thrust they've made and they're not coming again. How long has it been quiet up there? All day. I've sent patrols out and they're meeting no resistance. I think the Japs are pulling back. Come on, lads. Now put your back into it. We need that up there. I don't understand why you're up here. We've had him at a ridge for three days and the Japs are falling back. I didn't want to come up here. MacArthur's in a panic. Curtin just does what he's told. Why didn't you have the guts to stand up to MacArthur? And why didn't you tell him I could handle things? I was ordered up here. When MacArthur says come, I come. My job's on the line too. MacArthur's got no right to sit back there and pass judgment. Why doesn't he get off his backside and come up here and see conditions for himself? Half the time my men are wading through mud up to their waist. Most of the supplies we've dropped get lost in the jungle. And they're falling like flies with malaria because we've got no quinine. They're just kids. And they're not fighting a handful of Japs. There's a whole crack assault force coming over that trail who've totally rewritten the book of tactics. Now, it's taken a lot of guts and a lot of lives. But we've learned all the tricks, and we're holding them. Now, what more can we do? You tell me. I appreciate what you've done, Sid. Coming up here now makes it look like you've got no confidence in me. Or in my men. Now, I won't tolerate that. We can work this out, Sid. The Japs have got the supply line problems now. In a couple of weeks, we'll be pushing them back. Now, am I to be in charge of that operation, or am I not? We can work jointly. Jointly? I do all the hard slog stopping them, and then you come up here to grab all the glory, just when we look like getting them on the run. I am still commander of Allied forces. Unless you show me respect and accept my presence, I'll have to send you home. Well, if you intend to stay here, then that's just what you'd better do. Some of the most courageous scenes ever witnessed in modern warfare have become a day-to-day -day occurrence along the notorious Kokoda Trail. In a battle theater where human endurance is pushed to its ultimate limits, we can all be proud of the fact that our diggers have given their all. The word Kokoda has become synonymous with courage and endurance and will live as a symbol of guts and fortitude for generation upon generation of Australians yet to come. Good. This is going to be a quick, clean campaign, Dick. We'll have the Japs out of New Guinea before Christmas. It'll be the first big land victory against the Japs in the war. We must be certain that credit goes where credit is due. The Australian newspapers are sure to heap the praise on Blaney. I know how much you hate flying, General, but I really think you should be up there in Moresby. I know it's irksome, but uh, journalists do tend to take things at face value. Moresby. Moresby's a shanty town. How can I run a war from there? I wouldn't let you go up there, General, unless I could arrange suitable accommodation. General? 
General. Congratulations on your successes. Thank you. There's something endlessly fascinating about the tropics. The boys up on the trail don't find it fascinating. We still don't know how many of the buggers are there that'll dug themselves in by now. And a lot of them will want to fight to the death, honor an emperor and all that bullshit. They got nowhere to go now but the sea. Basie, your Australians are going to go in there and take Gurna. General Harding, you'll have the chance to show us what the 32nd are made of at Buna. Just let us at him. You're going to have problems getting at him. The jungle's as thick as I've seen it there. And when you're under roof cover, you never see daylight. And if you put one step out of place, you're up to your waist in swamp. Can't be worse than what we've been through already. We'll make them sorry they ever left Tokyo. I fail to understand how, with an overwhelming superiority of numbers, we have been ignominiously routed. The Australians haven't been routed. They're stuck in there and they're going to take Gurna. It's your boys who've thrown down their rifles and run. No one has told me that. <laughs> I'll bet. No one's been game to tell you, but I will. I sent one of my men over there this morning, and he said it was a shambles. Your officers, from brigadier down to platoon level, just can't get their men to go back and fight. Oh, I know bloody well what you blokes have been saying about me and my men ever since you got here. Bunch of colonial no-hopers, unreliable, unprofessional. And haven't got the guts. I've heard all the jokes. They get around here very quickly, you know. And I'll tell you, General, as far as I'm concerned, they weren't very funny. Now, I don't want to appear to rub your face into it, but bugger it. My men are out there making heroes of themselves at Gona. And your lot have given up the ghost, frankly, in future. I'd rather put Australians in. At least I know they'll fight. Bob, I'm putting you in command of Buna. Remove all officers who won't fight. Relieve regimental and battalion commanders. If necessary, put sergeants in command to battalions and corporals in charge of companies. Use anyone who'll fight. Perhaps may land reinforcements at night, so time is of the essence. Bob, do this for me, and I'll get you the Distinguished Service Cross. We'll release your name to the newspapers as the man who captured Buddha. Bob, take Buna, or don't come back alive. Bugger them. They've had their chance. I'm pulling the Americans out and sending them back to Fort Moresby. MacArthur can't do a bloody thing about it. I'm commander of land forces. Uh, don't be too hard on them. They're only kids. They're only kids. They shouldn't have been sent there. Give him a few more days, Tom. Arkelberg is a bloody good man. If anyone can inspire them, he can. Attack in thousands, not hundreds. You have seven or eight times the strength of the enemy. I feel convinced that our time is limited. We must achieve results shortly, or the whole picture could radically change. Lead them, Bob. Lead them. The Australians have won Ghana. I want you to give me Buna now. Attack in thousands in jungle this day. There are about five narrow cracks through the swamp on an eight-mile front. There's got to be a better way of doing it, Dan. You tell me, I'll do it. We're dug in and pillboxes upstairs and take anything we throw at. Yeah, well, we're going to have to run and flush them out of their holes, jack by jack. When we do, the big maniacs go straight up and freeze the sniper. But if they can fight like maniacs, so can we. Move your boys, Stan, we're doing it.
Excuse me, General. This looks better. Mm. I knew my boys wouldn't let me down. Would you like me to send a message of congratulations to Weichelberger? You don't congratulate a soldier for doing what he's there to do. The Papun campaign is in its closing stage. Una has been overrun, and the last remnants of the Japanese forces face total destruction. The recapture of New Guinea can now be regarded as accomplished. No campaign in history against a thoroughly prepared and tested army produced such complete and decisive results you're to be congratulated, Tom. Congratulations are premature. This campaign isn't over, not by a long shot. Just mopping up. There are at least 4,000 Japs up there dug into bunkers. This is all that's left. When we started back up the trail, there were at least 15,000. Not the 2,000 that you kept throwing in our face. And we lost over 3,000 men. And a lot of them died because you kept bombarding them with your hysterical orders, attack, attack, attack. This has been a bloody and costly campaign, and it's not over yet. Enjoy your trip back to Brisbane. At least you should thank Eichelberger. He took a bunch of raw kids didn't know what end of the rifle was up. Turned them into heroes. Tom? I called you men cowards, and I was wrong. I just didn't realize the conditions and difficulties. Why didn't you go up and have a look for yourself? I did. Your men didn't die in vain, Tom. The Japanese aren't invincible any longer. Because of what your men did, as my men did, the world knows they can be beaten. And Roosevelt will have to give us our men and equipment. Because we've shown we deserve it. Whatever you think of me, I think you're one hell of a soldier. We're never going exactly like each other. Can we just call a truce? I suppose we'd better. We've got years more of this to go. When I'm up there in Tokyo, Taking the surrender. You'll be there, Tom. That's a promise. I owe you an apology, Tom, old chap. I thought your boys were dragging their feet up there for a while. So I noticed. We all make mistakes. Lucky you brought the seventh back. We'd have been stuffed up there without him. If I didn't know better, I'd think you just paid me a compliment. Well, don't let it go to your head. Are the casualties going to be just as bad for the rest of the way? Sure to be. No one ever wins a war. When are we going to learn, Tom? <laughs>